Greetings again to all of you. Finally, I have arrived to the last part of my presentation. I realize that it is way too long for a single class, so let's take it as a kind of preparation, preparatory material for my upcoming semester-long uh, course on the very same topic. Uh, coming back to the typology uh, of which I was talking about so far, uh, postmodern uh, fiction turn to esoteric themes in various ways. We saw that the beginning goes back to the 19th century when Romanticism and a certain dissatisfaction with the Enlightenment started focusing on occult features, esoteric phenomena and incorporating them into fiction. But we also have to say that there was always on the part of the writers an ambition to in the end scientifically explain uh, or at least trying to explain what has happened in connection with those esoteric phenomena. Uh, in the early 20th century the kind of notion and the feeling about the uncanny emerged uh, greatly influenced by the rise and development of psychoanalysis. So uh, then we had a long series of examples which could be labeled as the writers of the uncanny. And uh, what we see even in the 1990s uh, is a great proliferation of these uncanny kind of uh, fiction. However, from 2000 or we can go back to the middle of the 90s, we see a new trend emerging in, in postmodern fiction which uh, much more freely and uh, if you want in a much more imaginative way on the, on, the, uh, on the other hand a much more irrealistic way started mixing esoteric magical occult elements with uh, storytelling. Uh, what I'm going to uh, demonstrate now are some cases when uh, the postmodern occult mixes with fantasy and melts with fantasy in a number of cases or when it melts with thrillers and crime stories and there is a third category which I'm going to mention at the at the end of my presentation when all these three elements the occult fantasy and thriller are melted together and we'll see to what extent this can be successful or not. Uh, the first example relates us to fantasy writing. And again we have to see that the uh, great first proliferation of fantasy writing goes back to the 1930s, 1940s, 50s when especially two uh, writers, uh, Tolkien and uh, C.S. Lewis, were in the forefront. But actually the real cult of Tolkien only starts in the 1980s which then eventually uh, generates a Tolkien industry and it culminates also in major uh, filmic projects like uh, Peter Jackson's famous Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. This of course generated interest in esotericism and occults as well and uh, one of the uh, first major postmodern examples for that is the Harry Potter stories by Rowling and of course all of us know about it either from the books or from the films or in combination. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Harry Potter because uh, on the one hand it's too uh, well known on the other hand in my opinion there are more interesting or exciting examples. And the first example is Philip Pullman's uh, trilogy uh, titled His Dark Materials. Uh, His Dark Materials was written and published between 1995 and 2000 and among other interesting features it also shows a kind of uh, general and expanding trend in this kind of occult plus fantasy writing, namely that it was directed to so-called young adults young adults who are just growing out of uh, fairy tales and uh, other kinds of uh, fantastic and, uh, and tale-like fictions and moving towards serious fiction and in between they have to go through this wonderland of the various fantasies. Now a scholar whom I have already quoted before, Jocelyn Godwin, mentioned about this work I'm focusing now on, 
Philip Pullman's Dark Materials, that this is the intelligent people's Harry Potter, which uh, in a way indicates that the uh, trilogy, although primarily focused for young adults, can attract a very wide, a much wider reading audience, including uh, grown-ups and uh, very intelligent and culturally uh, informed people. Like myself, when I started reading it, I was beyond 50, and uh, the, uh, the work immediately sucked me in. I found it fascinating. Not only that it's a page turner, the story is uh, really very, very exciting, but on the other hand, there are several layers of philosophical, cultural, historical uh, information in it, which I'm sure young adults could not pick up in their complexity, but for other types of readers like myself was very, very exciting. Uh, of course, I'm not going to tell the story. It's a very complicated story, and presently, uh, the uh, I think it was the BBC who started a new series, uh, reworking uh, the volumes. And as opposed to previous efforts and films like the film with Nicole Kidman a couple of years ago, uh, this series seems to be very good and very faithfully following the plot line at the same time, very imaginatively putting it in, onto the screen and visualizing the descriptions in the in the novel. So I'm not going to tell about the, the story. I'm just mentioning that the titles of the three uh, volumes are The Golden Compass, The Subtle Knife, and The Amber Spyglass. And the uh, two most important ideas in the novel is that there are parallel worlds existing next to each other. Uh, the same places uh, exist in slightly different forms, and normally there is no uh, trespassing or, tra or transition sorry, uh, transfer between these uh, different worlds, but in among uh, special circumstances uh, cleavage opens on the dividing walls and you can move from one world to the other parallel world. Uh, at the beginning of the novel Oxford is doubled like this and later on in the trilogy we will have multiple examples for that. This is one interesting idea and of course the happenings in the different parallel worlds are independent in one way, on the other hand it's also uh, they influence each other. The other interesting idea of the novel is the uh, personification of the human soul, which is called demon in the novel, <coughs> and actually humans have demons uh, visible next to them in animal forms, and actually until you are a grown-up uh, after puberty your demon can still change shape, a shape shifter, uh, and it's only after you become a grown-up uh, or a mature person that your demon gets fixed in one form or another animal form. So this is a kind of playful reference back to Platonism, and indeed uh, Philip Pullman was influenced by a number of different cultural influences, including Platonism, mysticism, Gnosticism, and other features. Uh, he has also been influenced by some great works of English literature, primarily Milton's Paradise Lost and William Blake's poetry, with the figure of Saturn and different approaches to Saturn, because we have a full great chain of being in these novels, uh, moving from the most elementary material particles, which is called dust in the novels, going up to uh, supernatural beings, angels, uh, however, God is a very controversial and trickily shown character. Um, if you read the novels, you will know why. Uh, but we have to remember that Philip Pullman is a professed atheist. So he wrote a novel which is full of supernatural things, full of references to religions, and at the same time he claims himself to be an atheist. Now, this has been uh, debated, discussed, uh, and even refuted by a number of critics claiming that uh, this atheism is not really a real atheism, uh, but it's a kind of uh, materialist deism or something like this. Uh, certainly, the novel fulfills or fits into the general tendency of uh, 
cultural development, which has been much discussed in religious studies and in sociology, namely that humans were moving from a supernatural and superstitious world through religions to science. This is what Max Weber called uh, disenchantment. But in the 20th century, the trend turned around and this disenchantment was not fulfilling humans anymore. So new religiousness, uh, new religiosity replaced it. At the same time, leaving humans skeptical or fed up with the uh, institutionalized traditional religions. And this is how we arrive at the new age, which uh, cannot be called a non-religious or atheistic or materialistic uh, attitude. On the other hand, uh, offers alternative religious practices. And some people say that fantasy literature in one way or another can be a substitute for uh, institutionalized religions. It uh, makes people sensitive and susceptible to rituals and uh, ritualistic communities. So uh, this is what uh, Christopher Partridge and other scholars call re-enchantment. We are in the process of re-enchantment and uh, a very important aspect of re-enchantment is the new interest in the occult. Uh, Partridge calls it occulture. We live in a world of occulture which kind of exists parallel with the rationalistic scientific world which is also very important in our life. Just think of having a extremely fantastically versatile smartphone and you may use this smartphone to make your horoscope or reading uh, futuristic prophecies or taking part in uh, various occult rituals. A couple of years ago, one of my students uh, wrote an MA thesis on cyber shamanism, and that was quite an interesting stuff. Uh, okay, coming back to Pullman. So there are a few features in the, his Dark Materials which uh, are worth uh, mentioning. The work echoes various radical heterodox traditions. Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, Clairvoyance, and uh, some of these have already been mentioned in my general introduction in the first part of this uh, presentation, like Gnosticism and Hermeticism. Uh, there's also a very strong uh, motive of apocalypticism in the novel. Uh, certain uh, cataclysms uh, which uh, shake humanity, at the same time, here he uh, launches a strong criticism against church tyranny, but he also refers to ecological disasters. And finally, we arrive in the last volume at a huge cosmic war uh, between uh, good and bad powers, including both supernatural creatures and humans. And the idea is to create the Republic of Heaven. Uh, instead of the kind of uh, empire of heaven or something like this. Another uh, fascinating feature of these novels is how it relates to the Bible. Everybody knows the story of the creation from Genesis and uh, the story of the fall of Adam and Eve. Now this is uh, put in a completely new light in this novel and the two teenager main characters of the novel uh, are developing into uh, characters as the new Adam and Eve. Also the Enochian myth, which I'm not sure if I talked about this in details uh, before, but uh, Enoch, the biblical character who was supposed to have direct contact with God and he was uh, privileged to be a conversation partner of God still in his life. That is Enochian myth also appears in a, a kind of a crooked way in the novel because Enoch uh, appears as a tyrant and a manipulator of God, as the regent of God. Um, anyway, it's all exciting and intriguing, so I very much suggest you to go and read it. Interestingly, when I started teaching Pullman at the English department here uh, about 10 years ago, as far as I count, uh, all my students knew it, everybody read it. And when I ask my students now, 10 years later, it's practically unknown. It shows how quickly 
literary fashions uh, change, how quickly bestsellers disappear from the scene, but sometimes it's really worth revisiting uh, these things. Let's see what is our next test case. And the next test case is also a page turner and very interesting. And this is one of Dan Brown's novels, uh, The Lost Symbol, which was published in 2009. Now Dan Brown is famous for his various um, cultural intellectual thrillers. Most famous, of course, is The Da Vinci Code. But I'm, uh, I have a uh, strong opinion which diverse were from most uh, superficial approaches to Dan Brown because normally you can hear that Dan Brown is using occult themes to develop his uh, thriller uh, plots. In my opinion, The Da Vinci Code is not, a, not an occult novel. There's no real occult uh, motive in it. It's more like a conspiracy theory. And most of his novels are revolving around various conspiracy theories, but not real delving into, into questions, even theoretical questions, into the esoteric. On the other hand, The Lost Symbol is very, very heavily about that. Uh, the uh, main plot, as you might know, is in connection with uh, Freemasonry. It takes place in Washington, and of course there is a usual Dan Brownian uh, thriller story, a uh, huge uh, threat against mankind, and finally the main character, Professor Langdon, professor of symbology, helps to solve this uh, riddle. But in the meantime, I would say that this is one of Dan Brown's most uh, detailed and most uh, inspiring uh, thinking about various uh, human uh, ways of thinking. Actually, his recent one, uh, Origin, is similar in that, similar to that. So these are my two favorites by Dan Brown. And uh, basically, the question is: What are the limits of human knowledge? What are the limits of human science? And uh, if uh, the esoteric traditions can contribute to the development of our uh, knowledge of the universe and are becoming masters of ourselves and our lives. Uh, in the center of this kind of thinking in the novel, there is the uh, I O N S. Institute of Noetic Sciences, and apparently this is an existing institution. You can Google on it and you can find their homepage. Another uh, institute is mentioned, the PEER, which is the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. And basically uh, connecting these uh, very modern and at the same time bordering on the esoteric scientific institutions to ancient traditions of wisdom, we have very, very interesting uh, propositions in the novel. Uh, I would like to read a couple of passages from it. Some of these passages you can see on the, on the handout, which I'm projecting now, I mean on the, on the slide. But um, I've chosen uh, a little longer set of quotations, and uh, it will show why this novel can be so interesting from our viewpoint, from, from the viewpoint of esotericism and uh, the occult. So, here are the quotations. Experiments at facilities like the Institute of Noetic Science had categorically proven that human thought, if properly focused, had the ability to affect and change physical mass. Our thoughts actually interacted with the physical world, whether or not we knew it, effecting change all the way down to the subatomic realm mind over matter. This is one of the kind of main slogans of the book, that mind over matter. Uh, one of the main characters of the novel is a woman, Catherine, who is doing this noetic uh, experiments. And, uh, and here is uh, what we learn about her. Human thought can literally transform the physical world. As Catherine's experiments grew bolder, her results became more astounding. Her work in this lab had proven beyond the shadow of doubt that mind over matter was not just some new age self-help mantra. The mind had the ability to alter the state of matter itself and, more important, the mind had the power to encourage the physical world to prove in a, in a specific direction. We are the masters of our own universe. 
uh, Catherine has a brother who is a much more occultist uh, than Catherine herself. And uh, here's a quotation by this brother. The key to our scientific future, her brother often said, is hidden in our past. A lifelong scholar of history, science and mysticism, Peter had been the first to encourage Catherine to boost her university science education with an understanding of the early hermetic philosophies. And now we are arriving at the kind of fusion interaction between the ancient wisdom and uh, modern knowledge. The uh, noetic science is defined in the following way. The word noetic derived from the ancient Greek nos, translating roughly to inner knowledge or intuitive consciousness. Now, there's a software mentioned in the novel which is capable of almost magical mystical things. The software was designed to help government agencies better evaluate and respond appropriately to wide-scale crises, pandemic diseases, national tragedies and terrorism. Uh, I would say that this is a very opportune moment to read this novel because of the pandemic context. Uh, and uh, now we move to the side of skepticism. Professor Langdon, who is a symbologist and who has been dealing with esotericism and, and occult thinking, like myself, for a lifetime, he is not an insider, he is not a full believer. And uh, Dan Brown very uh, nicely kind of explains his attitude, which I find very close to my own attitude. Uh, first of all, he says, the ancient mysteries refer to a body of secret knowledge that has amassed long ago. One intriguing aspect of this knowledge is that it allegedly enables its practitioners to access powerful abilities that lie dormant in the human mind. Virtually every mystical tradition on earth revolved around the idea that there existed arcane knowledge capable of imbuing humans with mystical, almost godlike powers. Tarot and I Ching gave man the ability to see the future. Alchemy gave man imp Im immortality through the fabled philosopher's stone. Vika permitted advanced practitioners to cast powerful spells. As an academic, Langdon could not deny the historical record of these traditions, troves of documents, artifacts and artworks that indeed clearly suggested the ancients had a powerful wisdom that they shared only through allegory, myths and symbols ensuring that only those properly initiated could access its power. Nonetheless, as a realist and a skeptic, Langdon remained unconvinced. Uh, one more thing about <coughs> the lost symbol. Uh, one of the central uh, symbolic elements of the novel is the fresco in the rotunda of the uh, capital in, uh, in Washington and uh, it's uh, an apotheosis of George Washington, who was the founder of the state. This uh, painting gets a very detailed and very illuminating interpretation in the course of the novel, and the conclusion is the following. This transformation of man into God is called apotheosis. Whether you are aware of it, this, this theme, transforming man into God, is the core element in this rotunda's symbolism. So basically, the exaltatio about, about which I was talking in the first introductory part is very well highlighted and very well problematized in this novel.